me to <coughs> talk about James Collins' work tonight. I, I wanted to give you uh, just a little bit of background about how and why um, I wanted to write about him. Uh, kind of how, the, how I was connected to Gibson County and Madison County. Uh, how that all came about. When I was when I was 40 years old, I knew nothing about my Tennessee ancestors, not one thing. Uh, I had always been curious about them, and uh, this this book is kind of the result, in a way, of me learning about this gentleman, uh, who was an uncle of mine. He was a brother. Uh, I'll show you as we go along who, how you know where he's connected to Gibson County and, and his brother that lived here. But uh, James Collinsworth uh, was pretty, pretty instrumental in Tennessee history and Texas as well. I came uh, to know about my ancestors here in 1994 through this letter. Uh, it was from a cousin whom I had never heard of named Mobley, Jackson Mobley Collinsworth, and I thought, that's kind of a strange name. I, I don't know, but he was writing, telling me about this cemetery that's out on Tom Dunlap Road, and he was requesting on Tom Dunlap Road. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he he was telling a lot of people. I guess he had sent letters out. He was trying to raise some money to help for the upkeep of the cemetery. Well, I thought it was a scam. And, uh, I really did, I, because I'd never heard about it and never heard of him. Luckily. I did not just throw the letter in the trash. I put it in my nightstand, and there it sat for several months. And several months later, I came down with the flu, and I was kind of homebound for about a week. And I was reading a book that my cousin from California that had written uh, a self, uh, an autobiography called Millicent. Her name was Millicent Collinsworth. And in that book, she described some things about my ancestors, at least from Arkansas, whom Mobley had mentioned in his letter, I think. Uh, so I went back and got the letter, and his phone number was on there, so I gave him a call. Uh, this was the second page of the letter where he was asking for money, and that's the part that scared me. Uh, now, we did meet... Uh, we met in Memphis at the library there on a neutral uh, premise so that we, you know, he couldn't take advantage of me and I wasn't <laughs> going to take advantage of him. So that was kind of funny. And, but the mistake I made, I took my children along with me and they weren't too keen on all this history <laughs> stuff. But Mobley came walking into the library that day like this with his maps and documents and all his, all his uh, paperwork. I mean, it was really something to see. There was a big table like this, and he just laid it all out. And one of the things he laid out was this map of Texas. And he began telling me about James Collinsworth. So um, there's a picture of him here. He's on, I think that's your left. Yeah with his dad, Emmett. Uh, Emmett lived in Gad uh, Gadsden, where uh, my mother grew up. He turned down Quincy Street, going toward the bank. It's a third house on the right, a little uh, frame house with a green roof. But he was in the Navy in World War II. Uh, his children tell me that every time he got a, a leave or a furlough, he would be digging up bones. You know, he'd be in the libraries or somewhere looking at the, in the archives looking up records so this was this was the letter that, that he wrote me after i called him which once again scared me to death because i think is, is it on this page maybe the next one um yeah he says, if you come to Tennessee and we go looking around where your ancestors have lived, that you'll be making a 360 to 380 mile round trip. I wasn't too keen about getting in the car with a guy that I'd only met once 
and, and doing that. So it actually never happened, and I regret it today. But um, he shared so many things with me. And then, uh, right. oh, I thought I had actually so taken that. Huh? Well, <laughs> the next encounter I had in Tennessee was, I, I thought I had taken this one out, uh, actually, but that's okay. <clears throat> I came some years later, probably about 2000, and I wanted to find the cemetery that I mentioned a while ago. Well, I spent the night in Humboldt. I actually spent it in my car because I, um, I, I was coming back from Nashville. I was extremely tired. I wanted a hotel room, but I didn't know anything about Humboldt. I should have gotten one in Jackson. Uh, I actually came in on Main Street here, and I didn't see a hotel anywhere. So I thought, well, I've got a map, and I'll just go on out and find the cemetery, and then I'll just maybe go back into town and try to find a room. Well, I was so tired from that drive that I just thought, I'll just pull over here, and I pulled over in a field out there, <laughs> and I had a blanket in the truck, and I just uh, reclined in my car seat, and I spent the night there, because I was so excited to find that cemetery and wanted to see it at daybreak the next morning. <clears throat> so, uh, as I was in the cemetery the next morning, a gentleman came by in his truck and stopped, and I'm sure he was curious as to why I was there so early in the morning. And he asked me what I was doing. I don't know who he was, but I told him and he, uh, that I was a Collinsworth. And he said, oh, Kimbro uh, Dunlap up in town has written a, a book or a story about right, yeah. the Collinsworths. So I began to uh, try to find Kimbro before I was going to leave that day. Well, it just so happened I came into town, I found his office, went into his office, and he had called in sick. Oh. <laughs> so they, they got him on the phone and I was able to talk to him, at least on the phone. But after we had talked that day, then he wrote me a letter and he began telling me again about James Collinsworth. So these guys were really putting me on the road to, to uh, <clears throat> wanting to know more. <clears throat> this is a picture that, a picture of a portrait that Kimbrough shared with me. And supposedly this was um, when James was district attorney for the Western District of Tennessee in 18, from about 1829 to 1835. <clears throat> the thing I didn't know at the time was that the Western District of Tennessee was what we know as Middle Tennessee, because this was still Indian country. <clears throat> this, this part of the state was. So <clears throat> he, he was the oldest uh, brother in this family and B.F. Collinsworth, Benjamin Franklin Collinsworth, was the next oldest. And uh, B.F. married a girl from Rutherford County, <clears throat> uh, Margaret, uh, I mean Elizabeth uh, Mason, whose father had come and settled here from Rutherford County at Mason Grove. And that's where oh, it got um, its name. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> that that's a, a pretty interesting thing. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But James and B.F.'s father, Edward, was a veteran of the Revolutionary War. Where did they live over? They lived in Antioch. You know where Antioch is? Out 24 south toward Murfreesboro. Yeah. My dad was in the on oh, Murfreesboro on, on uh, Mountain View Road. Yeah. But prior to that, where did come from? Virginia. Richmond County. Maybe that. Okay. We're going to be related to Canada. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but James and, and uh, B.F.'s father, Edward, as a young man, enlisted in what we, well, in the first Marine Corps, the very first one. Mm. 1775. My eyes were. 
but it, but it was six when he enlisted, but he didn't serve. In that day, someone else could serve for you. Evidently, according to his brother's pension papers, Edward uh, regretted having enlisted, and his younger brother John served in his place. I got a joke about that formation if you'd like. You may add it in here. Ready? Yeah. All right. The Marine Corps was founded in Ton Tavern in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1775. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, after they formed it, they had to do some recruiting. Mm -hmm. So they were in Ton Tavern and they asked the guy running the tavern there, said, would you recruit some Marines for us? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a Marine Corps joke. I think you'll get it. But anyway, he said, yeah, I'll be glad to. So he, first young man comes in, he says, you want to join the Marine Corps? And he says, Oh, and he said, I tell you, if you do, I'll give you a loaf of bread and a mug of beer. And the guy said, okay. And he said, now go sit down over at that table. Yeah. So he went and sat down. A few minutes, another one comes in. You want to join the Marine Corps? Well, I'll give you a mug of beer and a loaf of bread. Okay. See, go sit with that other guy at that table. Okay. Now the third guy comes in. He says, uh, you want to join the Marine Corps? And the guy says, I just don't really think I'm interested in he's Finally, he says, look, if you'll join, I'll give you two mugs of beer and two loaves of bread. Whereupon one of the guys at the table said to the other, it ain't like it was in the old Corps. <laughs> That's, good That's a Marine Corps thing there, the yeah. old Corps versus the new Corps. Yeah. That's good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <clears throat> but John served on a uh, sloop called Liberty. Uh, the Marine Corps... I guess at that time it was actually a navy too. It, it pretty much uh, they had the people kind of like it is now. The sailors on the navy ships mm -hmm. uh, running the ship, but they brought the marines on there because when somebody attacked them, they were the ones that fired back. And mm -hmm. if they landed any place, they went in and did whatever they had to do. That's what they did. But okay. their role expanded a few years after that. Yeah. But anyway, he served that that term <clears throat> for his brother and then in March of 77 they both enlisted in the 1st Virginia State Regiment they were uh, they wintered at Valley Forge in, in uh, December of 77 and first part of 78 and then they fought the British at Monmouth Courthouse when, they, when the British left Philadelphia and they were headed back to their ships actually uh, just across the river uh, in the New York. <clears throat> well, uh, Edward, after leaving Virginia, he's, he actually re enlisted in Montgomery County later in Virginia, but um, don't know if he saw any, uh, any actual action there. But after moving to um, Davidson County, uh, when the Creek Indian War broke out, he enlisted under Colonel Perkins, and he was wounded uh, down in Alabama at either a Muckfall or in a Tchopka. <clears throat> he came home six months later, enlisted again, and fought uh, at the Battle of New Orleans under uh, Colonel Coffey. So he had quite a span of military service and James I'm sure was influenced by that and some other things and I, I don't want to talk too much about his his other influences but I could spend a lot of time on that uh, I don't think I need to tonight but uh, this is the first record of B.F. Collinsworth being in Gibson or Madison County actually uh, he Got this land from his father-in-law, Abram Mason. Where was it in Madison? You know. You know where the cemetery is? Out here. Yeah. Yeah. It's that tract right there. It's forty acres. You're talking about what? Collinsworth Cemetery. Right? Yeah. No, I'm talking about Madison. Oh, yeah, Madison. It's yeah, it's um, it's on Mountain View Road, right in Bells, just just right off. Of oh, okay. Over oh, on the that side in Madison County. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now, are you talking about the Abram, the Mason? Whomever was lived lived in Madison County. Oh, uh, okay. Abram Mason's 
place. I don't know exactly where it was, but I do know where the Mason Cemetery is. Do you know where it no, is? I can't remember. I, I, <clears throat> it's off of Gadsden Todd Levy. Okay. To the south of Barbecue Road, about a mile, maybe. Okay. Yeah. But this track of land was where the cemetery is today. Okay. And that was the uh, first deed that I can find. He, he gave this to his daughter and son-in-law, Agra Mason did. So um, it was in the 10th District back then. I think it still is today. That's a map from that time frame. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this deed is uh, a deed to James M. Collinsworth, the oldest son of uh, B.F. Collinsworth. B.F. was my third great-grandfather. James M. was my second. Um, this if you notice, the last sentence says it's on the waters of Little Cypress Creek. And if you ever find anybody that knows where that is, please let me know. I've been trying to find it. I think I know about where this property was, but I'm not sure. I think it's in the Mason Grove area between there and Gadsden. <clears throat> but um, this photo is another one that Kimbrough provided. Uh, the gentleman on the left. Is that left to y'all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Was uh, James M. Collinsworth, my second great-grandfather. And he formed a company in Gadsden. It was originally called the Gadsden Spartans. It was about 100 men, and they mustered into service at Camp Fair, what we call Camp Beauregard, <clears throat> in Jackson on May 23, 1861. Um, became Company I of the 6th Tennessee. The guy beside him is a fellow that y'all possibly might have heard of in your searching around here called Dr. Bob Williams. He's buried in Rose Hill. He was, uh, I think, the first lieutenant <coughs> in that company. He didn't... <coughs> Grandfather James M., he didn't live very long during the war. He got pneumonia probably in August that summer while they were stationed at Madrid Bend and died at Tiptonville in September. Uh, and um, Robert Williams had rheumatism so bad that he was advised to resign. And so he did, and he came, became a doctor. And, uh, worked in this community. Oh, let me go back. You see the sword, the, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the guard on this sword? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of an unusual shape. It looks weird. Yeah. Well, that sword probably is huh. one, of, one of those designs right there. And that sword was possibly <clears throat> a sword that belonged to James's and James and, and B.F. Collinsworth's younger brother, John, who had graduated from West Point. <clears throat> uh, and I'm saying that because the style of the sword probably wasn't common to this area. And him being a cadet at West Point, there was a sword maker in Philadelphia by the name of Frederick Weidman who made these swords. And it's possible that that sword was handed down a couple of generations, or at least one generation. Yeah, it'd be two, uh, maybe, to him. <clears throat> the oldest son of James M., this is where we would leave Tennessee. Uh, my great-grandfather right here left Tennessee after his father had been dead a few, several years, I guess. Uh, he, was, he was about five or six years old when James M. died. <clears throat> and his um, mother didn't remarry for about eight or nine years. But uh, I, the last time I could find him in, uh, in Tennessee was in 1880 in Lake County. And after that, he went to Arkansas. Can I ask you about the Arkansas yeah. thing? Because that's something I... Yeah. Uh, at one time... 
was Arkansas a part of Missouri? Somehow, I think the boot heel. There was a question about the boot heel. Something in there, the part of part yeah. of it was mm -hmm. uh, part of Missouri. And it, as far as I know, only the boot heel was in I thought it was a little further, but it may have been, but it may have been in. There right. could have been. I didn't mean the whole state. I knew far. I yeah. was thinking a part of it. Okay. Um, but um, this this James, and there's actually five generations of James uh, consecutive, which I didn't even know about for many, many, <laughs> many years. <clears throat> but that was the family that he um, raised or fathered and helped raise. That's the one I knew about, and that lady, Hallie Williams, was living in a home that her father had built right after the Civil War. I think I got a picture of it right oh. there. Mm -hmm. and of course, it's not in great shape in this picture, but it was a pretty stately home for the little area where I grew up, uh, and her father had named it Five Oaks. There were five huge white oak trees that were in the yard of that house. And of course, uh, listening to the mayor talk about this house over here, this that this house to me was haunted as a kid. <laughs> and there was there was a stairwell uh, in the, the center of the house. <clears throat> and I remember my old great uncles telling me that that was where they would put the slaves when they were bad. Well, that wasn't true because there weren't any slaves when this house was built, but it made for a good story. Um, but there's uh, a picture of Grandmother Hallie uh, in her kitchen, and I'm over in the background, about a 10-year-old boy, yes, yeah. and my grandmother's there. And I have, um, I have that hutch in my house. I took it and restored it, so that was kind of a neat heirloom to have. <clears throat> but um, her father had also served in the Civil War, he fought at uh, Pea Ridge in Northwest Arkansas, and that after that battle, they marched all the way from Northwest Arkansas to the White River and boarded a steamer, <clears throat> and they were headed to Chickasaw Bluff. You know where that is. In route to help with what was going on at Shiloh. <clears throat> but they didn't get there in time. And then he later wound up being at uh, Richmond, Kentucky when that battle took place. <clears throat> but his company was held in reserve because they had traveled so much. But then he fought at uh, Stone River and was captured after the battle. He spent some time in the military prison but when she used to speak of uh, Yankees, and I don't want to offend anybody, she was a good, fine Christian woman. <laughs> they were always damn Yankees. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, I agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after Mary and Deborah 10 years ago, we went to the Hermitage once. I had never been there, and we were sitting there watching the little introductory film. <clears throat> and this popped up on the screen, and if you if you can see it down at the bottom, it lists the managers of President Andrew Jackson's inaugural ball. Yeah, see and, and so I really grabbed hold of that, and I started asking questions. <laughs> no one could tell me where that document could be found, but the state archives uh, found it for me. So that was pretty neat. Uh, <clears throat> James Collinsworth, after being district attorney from 29 to just right after the first year in 1835, went to Texas. We don't really know exactly why. He got caught up in their uh, effort to gain independence from Mexico. <clears throat> and when the Texans had their convention to declare their independence, it was James Collinsworth that the gavel to open the convention. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a pretty neat mm -hmm. thing to, to get to do that. He also served in some other capacities. Y'all may have seen this 
this painting before a picture of it. That that little convention was held in a one room building that had no windows. It just had uh, probably burlap tacked over the windows to keep the cold wind out. But that's where it all started at uh, Washington on the Brazos River. James was part of the committee that drafted the Constitution for the Republic of Texas. <clears throat> and then he nominated his old friend, Sam Houston, and that's as commander-in-chief. And that's, that's your relative. On the other side yeah. of the family. <laughs> and from what Kimbrough uh, shared with me, they had a long yeah. friendship <clears throat> back in Nashville. So that was pretty neat. Um, and then finally, when Sam Houston's army engaged uh, Santa Ana at San Jacinto, James was there as aide-de-camp to Sam Houston along with some other men, and his horse was shot at from under him. Uh, that's what this document is really telling. Uh, so we know that he wasn't just in a tent there. He was out on the battlefield. Afterwards, when a treaty was uh, struck with Santa Ana, uh, James had to act uh, as a temporary Secretary of State. So in that, on that treaty, his signature is there with Santa Ana and all the others. Mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. Uh, and then immediately following that, <clears throat> President Burnett uh, appointed James Collinsworth and Peter Grayson delegates to the United States. And that's a little bit hard for us to understand, but Texas was not part of the United States at that time. <clears throat> so they set out to Washington to try and meet with President Andrew Jackson to gain recognition of their independence from Mexico. Now, unfortunately, in route, the steamer they were on when they got when they uh, were on the Ohio River ran aground, and so they were late getting to Washington. Congress had dismissed, and Andrew Jackson had gone home to the Hermitage. So James went back to his home area <clears throat> and uh, visited with him at the Hermitage about all this. But he wouldn't do any. Uh, Jackson couldn't do anything. Texas didn't have the credentials yet. They didn't have a seal. They didn't have mm -hmm. actually all the real credentials they needed to gain that recognition. Uh, James, later in that year, was elected a senator from the Brazoria district, but he did not serve. He didn't want that position for some reason. But I guess he had something else in mind. Uh, he seems to have been a, a very ambitious person. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a sketch that I got from the Tarleton Law Library. Uh, <clears throat> it may be one of the most accurate uh, ones out there. I'm not sure. But, uh, they also have a copy of the book in their uh, library today. So we donated one to them. <clears throat> but on December 16th, a couple of neat things happened for James Collinsworth. One was... He had partnered with a, a man named Branch T. Archer to uh, form a corporation and had uh, submitted to, to the Congress of Texas for a charter for the Texas Railroad Navigation and Banking Company. This enterprise would have given them exclusive rights for the entire territory of Texas, the Republic, mm -hmm to build rail lines across it, to connect all the nav navigable streams, I have trouble saying that word, and for all the banking in the entire country of Texas. That was a huge endeavor. But Congress approved that charter, and all they had to do was raise the money necessary that was named that they, they had to actually present to uh, the Republic of Texas in order to keep that charter, and they had a time frame to do it. 
On the same day, he was appointed. Now, wait a second. Let me back up. I didn't talk about what happened in this photo. On the same day, he was appointed the first chief justice of, of that new republic of Texas. <clears throat> and then just about six months later, his brother John, who had resigned from the United States Army, John had actually acted as adjutant general uh, over several forts in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, up at Mackinac, at uh, Fort Dearborn, and some of the other uh, well-known forts. <clears throat> he had resigned and gone to Texas, Kimbrough says on recommendation of James, and John um, had been already made Inspector General upon his arrival, <coughs> uh, and, and then just six weeks after James's charter was given and he was named as um, Chief Justice, his younger brother was dead, and I'm sure it was devastating. Uh, he had some kind of an illness. He just, his doctor had described it as congestion of the brain. Right. I personally think that it was some type of malaria. Mm. Uh, the mosquitoes in, up in that upper peninsula area of Michigan, if they're anything like they are in Canada, they're just unreal. So I, I just have a feeling that's what it was. But then uh, <clears throat> just a year and a half later, there was a death of something that also that was very important to James, and that was the actual uh, nav you know, the railroad navigation and banking company. And what had happened was, as in a lot of cases, uh, people that would have liked to have maybe been part of that, or maybe they wanted to do something themselves, became jealous and. Uh, the newspaper editor, the, uh, the Telegraph there in uh, Houston, the editor began to attack this charter, <clears throat> this enterprise, and they gained enough support that Congress re uh, wound up provoking it. But, but the main reason was <clears throat> that they couldn't, uh, they could not come up with the gold necessary. They needed, I think it was $25,000 in gold. You mentioned that, that, that. Yeah. And they just couldn't raise it. Um, they they had been. I know James had been as far away as New York trying to solicit funds and sell stock and so forth, but it failed. Then, uh, after Sam Houston's term as president was about to expire, um, Peter Grayson, who had been one of those delegates with James had announced his uh, candidacy for president, but he was found dead at Bean Station, a suicide, <clears throat> and James Collinsworth announced his candidacy on June 30th, and 11 days later, he was found dead in Galveston mm -hmm. Bay. Mm -hmm. And some suspect that was suicide as well, uh, James did, uh, he did have an alcohol problem. So they had been murdered. Yes. This came from uh, an article that was printed in, uh, in New York the, at the Evening Post. I tend to, to think this is probably what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a great loss, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Great loss. <clears throat> in the probate records, as we began to explore more about James, one of the things that stood out is that there were two trunks that had his personal possessions. One of them was a leather trunk, and if you notice the contents, it's all military related. So we, I feel like that this trunk was actually John's, and James was probably, uh, it was probably given to him after James passed away. One of the things in there, it says an old, old coat. Old blue coat. Old blue coat. Yeah. I have a sneaky feeling that that was Edward's coat.
coat that he wore at the Battle of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. If you saw the the, uh, <clears throat> the display that was here in town about the, the, right. the War of 1812, and you saw the old militia man, mm -hmm. what kind of coat did he have? Blue. A blue denim mm -hmm. looking coat. So it, I, it's just a, it may not be, but it sure makes you think it could be. Uh, this gentleman in March of, I believe it was 2011, <clears throat> uh, was, yeah, that's right. The Washington on the Brazos State Park celebrated the 175th anniversary of Texas independence. And this gentleman was an interpretive park ranger, Scott McMahon. He was playing the part of James Collinsworth, and he had researched a lot about him. They have a little uh, building there that was very, very close to the building that was actually there when the convention was held. He wrote the script. He had done all that. And so it was neat to meet him and uh, give him a copy of the book later. And then <clears throat> while we were in town, Roy and I visited uh, the grave of James Collinsworth. It's in the old city cemetery in Houston. Uh, I think it's now called Memorial Park. And uh, so we don't know what's next, but uh, I got a feeling there could be another book down the, down the road. But it, it'll probably be a much different one than this one. Um, but uh, it's it's been a. I didn't say this in the beginning, but I but I wanted to say this somewhere tonight. For me to find out about my ancestors, to find out about them living in this immediate area, to to be able to come here, to live here, to explore here. <clears throat> There's a book that I had read by a guy named John Eldridge. He's a Christian writer, and uh, this book's called Wild at Heart. And in that book, he, he just kind of describes what little boys are made of. <laughs> and, and it really made me think because he said that there are three things <clears throat> about boys and young men and men is they all need a battle to fight, a beauty to rescue, an adventure to live. Oh my God. <laughs> and honestly, true. for me to come to Tennessee and marry uh, uh, the love of my life here 10 years ago, the battle to fight, I think, was just uh, getting that far along in life. <laughs> I don't know, but... The beauty to rescue was her, and the adventure to live, I've been living it since I've been here, because I get to explore all these things and learn all these new things, and it's just exciting and fun, and uh, I could I could probably talk for another two hours on things that I've learned and been able to do since I've been here, but thank you for uh, thank you. letting yeah, me be here tonight.